this evening, what we're going to be talking about is specifically the veil, um, whether it is, as our title says, a mark of separation or a statement of identity, uh, or indeed an affront to ancient British civilization or a vital liberty for all Muslim women, whatever. Um, we won't be taking any kind of a vote. I think that would be outside the spirit of this dialogue. But at the end of the evening, I will be asking for a show of hands as to whether anybody has had their mind changed a little by anything that they've heard anybody say this evening. Uh, it wasn't, of course, just Jack Straw who opened the debate on the veil, but he certainly pushed it into uh, the public domain uh, with a vengeance, particularly speaking of the full face veil, um, the niqab. Uh, we've also had, of course, the French ban on the um, jilbab even, and the, sorry, I get the words wrong. It's the hijab, the hijab, sorry, uh, on, of, the, <laughs> of the hijab. And the recent um, very striking case of the school teaching assistant, uh, who has, I believe, now lost her job, though there may be another appeal pending, uh, over her insistence on wearing the veil, or her apparent insistence on wearing the veil when there was a man in the classroom. So I'll introduce each panelist, and each one in turn uh, will just speak for a few minutes on where they're coming from, what their perspective is at the beginning of this discussion on this topic. Um, and let's turn first of all to Deborah Orr, because she's um, a very distinguished journalist, associate editor and award-winning columnist with The Independent and formerly edited Weekend Guardian magazine. And before Jack Straw, a couple of months before Jack Straw, she wrote articles criticizing the full face veil from a modern and feminist perspective. And these triggered intense and very interesting debates within the pages of The Independent. Um, I think for the debates, at least, we were, we were all grateful. Um, Deborah, would you like to kick off with, with what your perspective is? I think the point at which I really started to feel uncomfortable about full face veil was in a restaurant in London um, during the heat wave. I'd seen quite a lot of women toiling around, very, very hot and uncomfortable looking, and in this restaurant was a fully veiled woman with her western dressed husband and her western dressed children sitting at a table eating and lifting her veil to put her food into her mouth and that seems to me quite extreme behavior that, that you can just enjoy your food when you're outside without having to lift a veil and eat. Um, I feel about that level of restriction on a woman's freedom that um, it's uncomfortable for me. I was brought up understanding and admiring the battles that have been made by women before me over the last hundred years in order that I can have freedom to eat in public without having to cover my face, to uh, have an education, uh, to see myself as equal to men in every way and I really don't like the implication that women aren't equal and women have to um, be more careful than men and hide themselves more than men and that women are somehow responsible for male sexuality and for protecting themselves from men when I do believe that all people should take responsibility for themselves and their actions and what they do and shouldn't as adults be um, coddled by someone else and you know that, that, that women shouldn't take on responsibility for, for male sexuality in that way so those are my objections to the full veil I'm not against the hijab at all I think it's charming um, you see there are three things that have struck me about this debate since really for me it took off with Jack Straw I have to confess I didn't uh, read your piece till after that had happened and uh, the three things that kind of struck me about it were the fact that, so you can get into these debates and I could sit here right now, I could present the research that we've done, I could talk and sort of articulate the sort of feelings of liberation that many Muslim women have on adopting the hijab, the fa uh, niqab, face veil, burqas, you name it, they have a very clear perspective about this. And uh, as, I, as has been mentioned, I've been involved in quite a lot of research specifically in this country looking at what Muslim women themselves say they feel about wearing all these different types of attire. However, it seems to me that really that issue, not only has it been lost, but perhaps it's not even the right debate that we've been sort of being forced into having in the last few months. As a, I suppose I would describe myself actually as still a feminist after about 20 odd years, I probably 
like to talk a little bit about critical race feminism, about the idea that uh, women, wherever they are, they have their own experiences of different types of patriarchy, and you know, perhaps we should uh, try and work in solidarity with each other rather than berating each other. But again, I think that's been a little bit lost in the last few months. What I have found and what has really disturbed me is the fact that what we've been talking about, and specifically this idea of the veil being a mark of separation, is that we've become kind of completely focused, or when I say we, I should say really public commentators and politicians, on controlling public language with regard to other people. And in this case, it's specifically Muslim women and Muslim women who cover their faces. And part of that process, really for me, hasn't got anything to do with sort of issues of whether or not you believe these women are oppressed or not. It's about actually, if you like, expressing structural, and I use a kind of Americanized phrase here, whiteness. It's about actually forcing minorities into corners which they can't come out of. It's about forcing them into, onto the back foot and not allowing them to actually have a voice in a public space. When this thing kicked off and whenever it's been discussed, it's been in newspaper columns, it's been on television, and it's been by people who are generally unsympathetic, and Muslims in general, and Muslim women in particular, don't have the same access to all these avenues of debate. An, organ uh, an event like today is a good start, but we didn't start this discussion here. We've started it with Jack Straw complaining that he felt uncomfortable as I mentioned to Libby a little bit earlier, and perhaps it's something to ponder about, I don't recall him feeling uncomfortable when he was canvassing all of these women in his constituency who cover their faces for their vote, and quite surely most of them did vote for him. Azu, thank you. Um, we, I ought to mention just one thing, which I didn't mention in the introductions before we go on. That, of course, is the survey this week. I think the question of law will come into this. Uh, so far, neither of our speakers have been remotely in favor of any form of coercion. Uh, but one third of those polled did want a ban on the full face veil. And nearly two thirds wanted uh, it to be compulsorily taken away in cases of police questioning, immigration, all those sort of things. So, uh, and passport controls. This, uh, that, but that one third, I think, is something we should bear in mind. There was this survey, and it is rather a startlingly large number. Let's turn now to somebody for whom clothes uh, are, I suppose, a um, self-standing religion, or they might well be for some of her readers. Alexandra Schulman, editor of British Vogue magazine, she presides over this place where elegance counts most on the fifth floor of Vogue House in Hanover Square. She is a very distinguished journalist also. She was named Editor's Editor of the Year in 2004 at the British Society of Magazine Editors Awards and has an OBE for services to the magazine industry. Alexandra. One of the things that interests me coming from being, a, um, I guess, a fashion editor of kinds is is the question of clothes and identity. And um, in Western society, it seems to me that one of the things we most treasure is the ability to, um, to be individual in our dress and to be able to express ourselves through clothes um, in a very kind of varied way. And I'm kind of intrigued to know what the appeal is of, of losing that kind of liberation. I mean, I realize that one is expressing something by being veiled, um, but it's a different kind of expression. So that's one of the things I'm in, in, intrigued by. Um, I, I personally feel that anyone can wear anything they want um, and, and should be allowed to in this country. And I don't see why, uh, if Sikhs can wear turbans and nuns can wear veils, Muslims can't wear exactly what they want to, but I do think that um, one of the issues is a kind of, is this sort of polarization between the communities that has grown up post 9-11 and it can't be ignored that there is a huge wariness now on both sides. And I have an under a sympathy for people who, who do feel threatened by, um, I guess by the anonymity of total veiling, really. I don't think that the headscarf is, is, is an issue to most people, but it's, it's this, the fear of, of, of who hides beneath that I think is causing problems that might, might not have happened before 
9-11. But um, essentially my point of view is one of a, a neophyte in this subject and, and wishing to, to learn. I was telling Alex before the talk that um, I have three children under the age of three and uh, that in means that you end up forgetting things very easily. So I wrote down exactly what I was going to say. I thought very, very clearly about this. But I'm really happy to see um, Alexandra attend today and Deborah, of course. This is exactly the kind of dialogue we want to get going. But I'll, I'll just start it now. I won't take too long, I promise, Libby. Um, when I think about the oppression of women, I think about women who endure violence, sex discrimination, inequality of pay, rape, exploitation, and so on and so on. I don't think of the veil, or indeed the very clothes that I am wearing at the moment. The argument that because I wear more fabric around my body than my female counterparts in this society somehow makes me oppressed, leaves me somewhat bewildered, at times frustrated, and at times fatigued. The separatist theory, as visited by Mr. Straw and other politicians, is one we can easily put to test by using his own analogy. This veiled woman has entered his surgery, spoken to him in English, and raised issues with her MP that concern her about her society and constituency. The mere fact that she stepped foot into those offices exposes the allegation of separation as false. How is that being separate? He said that it made him feel uncomfortable. What about her comfort zone? Did he ever consider that this Muslim woman may herself feel uncomfortable, walking in to see her MP, who does have a not insignificant position in the government, who was the Home Office and Foreign Office Minister, who supported the waging of war of Iraq? I cannot imagine that that would make anyone feel easy. What right does he have to override that? What makes his comfort zone more important or significant than hers? My dress code, which symbolizes my very identity as a Muslim woman, says I have different values and I abide by Sharia law. Different, not divisive. Division is caused by government policies and the constant attack on how we as Muslims bring up our children, how we as Muslims, where we pray, how we as Muslims teach our children and what school we send them to. Community cohesion is left to dialogue such as this. Debate is not writing in the Lancashire Telegraph and then watching as Muslim women are attacked up and down the country. A debate is what you see before you right now. The Islamic dress is, I accept, different and may even be viewed as strange, but it is not discriminatory. Women in this society, as Deborah has said, have seen and continue to see endless struggles in order to get the vote, equal pay, bring about the Sex Discrimination Act, very committed and very strong women we've seen through history. When often looking to Islamic history, it is often pointed out that Muslim women have never gone through similar struggles and have never shouted for women's liberation. That is a fact. No such movement has ever taken place. No such voices have ever been heard. Because our faith, Islam, gave these very rights to women 1,427 years ago. And those rights remain today. Women have had the vote for that long, have had the right to buy and sell property for that long, have had the right to be paid exactly what a man is paid for doing exactly the same job for that long, and so on and so on. The saying that if it's not broken, don't fix it, has much meaning in this context. It is indeed true that women in Muslim lands suffer honor killings, domestic violence, rape, female circumcision, which I call mutilation, their oppression is clear, and I am never short of topics on my weekly show time and time again. But that is not as a consequence of our dress. They would say it is in fact the inverse of that. Their oppression is as a consequence of the absence of the very system that instills and protects that dress code, that of Islam and Sharia. There is no Sharia on the, in the Muslim world, contrary to any views you may hear. The myth that there is, is exactly that, a myth. 
not even in Saudi Arabia, where women are not even permitted the right to drive, and one was shot for even daring to do so. I want you to consider this for a moment. Would we ever go to our neighbour and tell her rather robustly that their skirt is hideous and doesn't match her shoes? No, it's insulting and unnecessary. Why is it then okay to do worse by labelling Islamic dress as causing separation, fear and resentment? Do we not deserve the same respect? Why aren't other women of other cultures accused of the same things, such as Ghanaians who also cover their heads and wear skirts to their ankles, many of whom are not Muslims? Or is this whole constant attack on Muslims, and especially more recently Muslim women, about something else? There was a time that this Labour government wrote legislation called the Human Rights Act, which included the freedom of religious expression. It seems that this act was now pretty window dressing. The belief in what you legislate in is truly shown when it is put to the test. Well, it is being tested right now, and they want to do away with it. Much like the Human Rights Act, my belief is under attack now. But Muslims the world over would never dream of new legislation. More women now, more than ever, are converting to Islam and wearing this dress code. Maybe we should be discussing that. What I am saying here is we need to tell Jack Straw that perhaps he needs to raise the level of debate and do away with the endless